Here's another picture that moves to um, a bubble that happens in 1720. And this bubble refers to the uh, picture that I gave you to look at. <coughs> and so um, that the, the picture is about <coughs> the stock market bubble uh, that occurred in, um, it started in 1719. Uh, <coughs> and um, it started first in France. So what you see is a picture of a street in France. <coughs> um, who has been to Paris? Okay, almost everybody here. And if you've gone to Paris, you may know this wonderful museum called the, um, the Centre Pompidou. Uh, it's the Beaubourg Center, and it's this great modern building. Um, and, uh, you know, people go there now, and you might see some fools and jesters and so forth, and people outside of this building. If you go one block behind the Centre Pompidou, um, you get to a street called the, the, uh, called the Rue Quincampoix, okay? And the Rue Quincampoix, this is like a perfectly appropriate sound effect, right? <laughs> <laughs> so, somebody just made like the killing of the stock market. It's a manic laughter that's coming to us. <clears throat> um, okay, so here you are. You're behind the Centre Pompidou. There's this narrow little street, and it's called the Rue Quincampoix. And actually, one end of the Rue Quincampoix was a place where some early finance uh, <coughs> took place, you know, money exchange and so forth, so forth. But the street looks exactly like this today, okay, minus all the people. Uh, it's, it, it's got these, um, you know, it's got these, uh, 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 you know, three or four story high buildings. And <coughs> so in 1719, you can't see this, but there is a guy here. His name is John Law. He's not, that's not a French name, it's a Scottish name. He's looking out of his window here, down on all of these people. And these people, <coughs> you can see them, they're trading pieces of paper. And they're trading paper in a company called the Mississippi Company. So, uh, uh, Law has this fantastic story um, that also connects into interesting behavioral phenomena. He was a Scotsman who was really good at mathematics. And uh, actually, his father was a banker. Uh, and uh, his father raised a lot of money. Well, father had enough money to send John to London. <coughs> so he leaves Scotland. He goes to London. His dad is sending him checks. Um, he takes the money, and he gambles it away. Okay? He gambles. Um, he just leads a completely uh, morally bankrupt life. He, he spends a lot of money on expensive clothes. Uh, he gets into London society, uh, and um, he just can't keep up with everybody. <clears throat> but um, it, uh, among his many talents, as I said, he was a mathematician, and this is at a time when probability mathematics was first getting started in, like, in uh, late 1600s, early 1700s. And he was a great tennis player, and he's a really handsome guy. Okay, so. You, you know, he had the makings of somebody that uh, he, he had a range of talents and 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 and, uh, and, uh, <coughs> and things. So, John Law, um, because he ran out of money, somebody put him up. He said, "Look, uh, if you do this job, well, you know, somebody put him up to killing somebody, getting into a duel. So he challenges somebody to a duel. Being a good athlete, he knew he was going to win." Uh, he kills the guy, and it was right in, um, <clears throat> let's see, uh, there's a little neighborhood right near the British Museum, uh, um, Bloomsbury. Um, he kills him in, like, the, the park in, in, in Bloomsbury. He gets put in prison, and then he's sentenced to death, and he escapes from prison. The person that arranged for him to, to do the murder um, gets him out of prison. He, takes, he gets on a boat, he goes out uh, of London, and he goes to Amsterdam. And then he starts a gambling parlor in Amsterdam. Uh, it ter he's really good at, uh, you know, if you're the banker in a gambling bank, if you set up a casino, you're always going to win. If you, get, if, you have, if you start with enough money and uh, you, you, you diversify, you, know, you, you do enough, um, you play enough games as a banker, you're going to win. So he not only wins, he wins really big, 
And over the course of about four or five years, he becomes one of extremely wealthy. Because his mathematical acumen, he's able to calculate the odds pretty, very well. <clears throat> and um, also, uh, as an aside note, this is when uh, gambling in, um, uh, in lotteries gets going. And he figures out that the Genoese lottery doesn't have, um, it, it was not designed very well. And if you buy up all these tickets, you could win. So then he buys up, he wins the lottery in Genoa. So this guy, you know, what an extremely peculiar person. But one of his gambling, uh, one of the persons that he is uh, involved with in gambling is the Prince Regent of France. That's the guy that, uh, that's the King of France, well, acting King of France when, uh, although his nephew, until his nephew gets old enough. And he tells the Prince Regent, look, I have a way for you to get out of uh, the, get the country out of its debt. And the way, uh, the, the way to do this is to create a company, actually to create a bank. He convinces him to create a bank. <coughs> And then um, to merge that bank with a company that owns all of the assets of, of the Louisiana Territory, essentially the center part of the United States. So this company, Mississippi Company, uh, is a company that is a completely speculative stock. Louisiana in 1719 had like, it had a few tents on it. Uh, but there was just nothing there. It was completely venture capital, weird speculation. But John Law, he's a great salesman. He sells this idea. He sells the shares to everybody in France. And so that's what they're trading. They're speculating on the future value of the center part of the United States. And, at the, and right now, there may be about 30 or 40 people that live in New Orleans at this time, but that's about it. <clears throat> and so the prices for the Mississippi Company, this is the first bubble. They start out, here's 1718, and here's 1719 starting here, going to 1720. This, they start out, and people go crazy about speculating on what's going to happen with the new world. So you know how people just uh, all of a sudden get the uh, uh, exciting idea that the BRICS uh, countries are going to be the next hot thing and you've got to own BRICS shares. This is the same idea. Look, if we don't have a foothold in owning assets that have to do with the new world, if everything's moving over to, to, to America, if that's where all of the new plantations are going to be, if that's where sugar is going to be, if that's, if that's the new economic world, this is a way you can get uh, a foothold into the new uh, economic world. And so the prices just kept going up and up and up and up and up. So <clears throat> there was logic to the speculation, but the logic uh, had to have some foundation, in, ha had to have some basis, some plausible uh, foundation. And that's one important element of a bubble. Uh, we can call it crazy, but the craziness has to be based on, on some level of plausibility. And Bob Schiller, in his work on on stock market bubbles and real estate bubbles, he, he really emphasizes, look, it, it starts with this plausible story that, you know, um, well, with the tech bubble, you know, technology is going to transform our world. We're all going to be using, um, <clears throat> we're all going to be using uh, handheld devices and uh, everything's going to be stored in the cloud and everything's going to be on the internet. We all believed that at the time. And it, in fact, it all came true. But it didn't mean that you're going to be able to cash in by buying uh, this, the shares. But the plausibility was there, and that's why the uh, shares in um, tech stocks went up like crazy in the, in the years before uh, the, the 2000. Okay, so what you can see from this is they, were hit, they hit a flat period. That flat period is, of course, when they shut down trading because everybody started to want their money back. And then... Of course, they opened the market back up and the shares went way down. They didn't go all the way down here. They went down a good ways, but still, if you'd go, you invested then and gone to sleep and woken up then, you'd feel like you'd become, you, you know, would have made lots and lots of money. But, uh, but this, he was blamed for this terrible uh, uh, crash. And when I say blamed, he was blamed big time. Um, 
he went from being the richest man in Europe. They took all of his assets from him in France. They chased him out of France. All he could do is he got away with his painting collection, which he went to Venice with, and he lived out the rest of his life in Venice. In Venice, Venice is where casinos were invented. So if, who's been to Venice here? Okay, lots of, lots of you. So if you're, in, um, if you're in the Piazza di San Marco, okay, and uh, on the one end is the, uh, is, is the church. If you go out the other end, and you go about 200 meters out the other end, you go by the uh, church called San Moise, and, um, <clears throat> th and John Law is buried in the church of San Moise. <coughs> Uh, and uh, <clears throat> so you have to hunt around. You can find his grave. It's a little stone in, in, in the floor. But right behind San Moise, that's where the first casino was. So it's a really appropriate uh, place for him to be buried, uh, which is uh, right next to where gambling was, was, was founded. But he had this idea. The reason why he was able to sell stocks to everybody, he understood how much people loved gambling. He understood if you could give somebody the, the dream of being able to make 10 times, 15 times, 20 times their money, they would be willing to accept something that maybe had a low dividend. And so that's really, he, that was that electric spark that got the whole idea of stock market speculation going. If he hadn't been running a gambling casino, he wouldn't have understood how this, this essential element of human nature, which wants to dream big, 